Book 9, Odysseus and the Cyclops, by Homer. Historical background. Although historical, archaeological, and linguistic evidence suggests that the epics were composed between 750 and 650 BCE, they are set in Mycenaean Greece in about the 12th century BCE, during the Bronze Age. This earlier period, the Greeks believed, was a more glorious and sublime age when God still frequented the earth and heroic, godlike mortals with superhuman attributes populated Greece. Because the two epics strive to evoke this pristine age, they are written in a high style and generally depict life as it was believed to have been led in the great kingdoms of the Bronze Age. The Greeks are often referred to as Achaeans, the name of a large tribe occupying Greece during the Bronze Age. Odysseus and his men sail upon the island of the Cyclops. They begin looking for food and come across the Cyclops' cave, which holds goats and cheese. Odysseus enters the empty cave to steal the food, but roams too long and the Cyclops returns. Book 9 Strangers, he said, who are you and where from? What brings you here by seaways? A fair traffic? Or are you wandering rogues who cast your lives like dice and ravage other folk by sea? We felt a pressure on our hearts, in dread of that deep rumble in that mighty man. But all the same, I spoke up in reply. We are from Troy, Achaeans, blown off course by shifting gales on the great South Sea, homeward bound, but taking roots and ways uncommon, so the will of Zeus would have it. We served under Agamemnon, son of Atreus. The whole world knows what city he laid waste, what armies he destroyed. It was our luck to come here. Here we stand, beholden for your help or any gifts you give, as custom is to honor strangers. We would entreat you, great sir, have a care for the gods' courtesy. Zeus will avenge the unoffending guest. He answered this from his brute chest, unmoved. You are a ninny, or else you come from the other end of nowhere, telling me, mind the gods. We Cyclopes care not a whistle for your thundering Zeus, or all the gods in bliss. We have more force by far. I would not let you go for fear of Zeus, you or your friends, unless I had a whim to. Tell me, where was it now you left your ship, around the point or down the shore, I wonder? He thought he'd find out, but I saw through this, or answered with a ready lie. My ship? Poseidon, Lord, who sets the earth a-tremble, broke it up on the rocks at your land's end. A wind from seaward served him, drove us there. We are survivors, these good men and I. Neither reply or pity came from him, but in one stride he clutched at my companions and caught two in his hands like squirming puppies to beat their brains out, spattering the floor. Then he dismembered them and made his meal, gaping and crunching like a mountain lion everything, innards, flesh, and marrow bones. We cried aloud, lifting our hands to Zeus, powerless, looking on at this, appalled. But Cyclops went on filling up his belly with man-flesh and great gulps of whey, then lay down like a mast among his sheep. My heart beat high now at the chance of action, and drawing the sharp sword from my hip I went along his flank to stab him where the midriff holds the liver. I had touched the spot when sudden fear stayed me. If I killed him, we perished there as well, for we could never move his ponderous doorway slab aside. So we were left to groan and wait for morning. When the young dawn with fingertips of rose lit up the world, the Cyclops built a fire and milked his handsome ewes all in due order, putting the sucklings to the mothers. Then his chores being all dispatched, he caught another brace of men to make his breakfast and, whiskey, and whisked away his great door slab to let his sheep go through. But he, behind, reset the, the stone as one would cap a quiver. There was a din of whistling as the Cyclops rounded his flock to higher ground. Then stillness, and now I pondered how to hurt him worst. If but Athena granted what I prayed for, here are the means I thought would serve my turn. <clears throat> a club or staff lay there along the fold, an olive tree filled green and left to season for Cyclops' hand. And it was like a mast, a lugger of twenty oars, broad in the beam, a deep sea-going craft might carry. So long, so big around, it seemed. Now I chopped out a six-foot section of this pole and set it down before my men, who scraped it. <clears throat> and when they had it smooth, I hewed again to make a stake with pointed end. I held this in the fire's heart and turned it, toughening it, then hid it well back in the cavern under one of the dung piles in profusion there. 
Now came the time to toss for it. Who ventured along with me? Whose hand could bear to thrust and grind that spike in Cyclops's eye when mild sleep had mastered him? As luck would have it, the men I would have chosen won the toss. Four strong men and I made five as captain. At, should be as, as evening came, the shepherd with his flock, his woolly flock, the rams as well, this time, entered the cave, by some shepherding whiz whim, or a god's bidding, sheep herding whim, or a god's bidding, none were left outside. He hefted his great boulder into place and sat him down to milk the bleeding ewes in proper order, put the lambs to suck, and swiftly ran through all his evening chores. Then he caught two more men and feasted on them. My moment was at hand, and I went forward holding an ivy bowl of my dark drink, looking up, saying, Cyclops, try some wine. Here's liquor to wash down your scraps of men. Taste it, and see the kind of drink we carried under our planks. I meant it for an offering if you would but help us home. But you are mad, unbearable, a bloody monster. After this, will any other traveler come to see you? He seized and drained the bowl, and it went down so fiery and smooth he called for more. Give me another, thank you kindly. Tell me, how are you called? I'll make a gift will please you. Even Cyclopes know the wine grapes grow out of grassland and loam in heaven's rain, but here's a bit of nectar and ambrosia. Three bowls I brought him, and he poured them down. I saw the fuddle and flush come over him. Then I sang out in cordial tones. Cyclops, you ask my honorable name? Remember the gift you promised me, and I shall tell you. My name is Nobody. Mother, father, and friends, everyone calls me Nobody. And he said, Nobody's my meat then, after I eat his friends. Others come first. There's a noble gift now. Even as he spoke, he reeled and tumbled backward, his great head lolling to one side, and sleep took him like any creature, drunk, hiccuping, he dribbled streams of liquor and bits of men. Now by the gods I drove my big hand spike deep in the embers, charring it again, and cheered my men along with battle talk to keep their courage up. No quitting now. The pike of olive, green though it had been, reddened and glowed as if about to catch. I drew it from the coals, and my four fellows gave me a hand, lugging it near the cyclops, as more than natural force nerved them. Straight forward they sprinted, lifted it, and rammed it deep in his crater eye. And I leaned on it, turning it as a shipwright turns a drill and planking, having men below to swing the two-handled strap that spins it in the groove. So with our brand we bored that great eye socket, while blood ran out around the red-hot bar. Eyelid and lash were seared. The pierced ball hissed, broiling, and the roots popped. In a smithy, one sees a white-hot axe head, or an adze plunged and wrung in a cold tub, screeching steam, the way they make soft iron hail and hard. Just so, just so, that eyeball hissed around the spike. The cyclops bellowed and the rock roared around him, and we fell back in fear. Clawing his face, he tugged the bloody spike out of his eye, threw it away, and his wild hands went groping. Then he set up a howl for Cyclopes who lived in caves on windy peaks nearby. Some heard him, and they came by divers' ways to clump around outside and call, What ails you? What ails you, Polyphemus? Why do you cry so sore in the starry night? You will not let us sleep. Sure no man's driving off your flock. No man has tricked you, ruined you. Gave the mammoth Polyphemus roared in answer. Nobody, nobody's tricked me. Nobody's ruined me. To this rough shout they made a sage reply. Ah, well, if nobody has played you foul, there in your lonely bed, we are no use in pain given by great Zeus. Let it be your father, Poseidon Lord, to whom you pray. So saying, they trailed away, and I was filled with laughter to see how like a charm the name deceived them. Now Cyclops, wheezing as the pain came on him, fumbled to wrench away the great doorstone, and squatted in the breach with arms thrown wide for any silly beast or man who bolted, hoping somehow I might be such a fool. But I kept thinking how to win the game. Death sat there huge. How could we slip away? I drew on all my wits and ran through tactics, reasoning as a man will for dear life, until the trick came, and it pleased me well. The Cyclops' rams were handsome, fat, with heavy fleeces, a dark violet. Three abreast I tied them silently together, twining cords of willow from the ogre's bed, then slung a man under each middle one to ride there safely, shielded left and right. 
so three sheep could convey each man. I took the wooliest ram, the choicest of the flock, and hung myself under his kinky belly, pulled up tight, with fingers twisted deep, and sheepskin ringlets for an iron grip. So, breathing hard, we waited until... When dawn spread out her fingertips of rose, the rams began to stir, moving for pasture, and peals of bleeding echoed round the pens where dams with udders full called for a milking. Blinded and sick with pain from his head wound, the master stroked each ram, then let it pass. But my men, riding on the pectoral fleece, the giant's blind hands blundering never found. Last of, last of them all, my ram, the leader, came, weighted by wool and and me with my meditations. The Cyclops patted him and then said, Sweet cousin Ram, why lag behind the rest in the night cave? You never linger so, but graze before them all and go afar to crop sweet grass and take your stately way, leading, among the, leading along the streams, until at evening you run to be the first one in the fold. Why now, so far behind, can you be grieving over your master's eye? That carrion rogue and his accursed companions burnt it out when he had conquered all my wits with wine. Nobody will not get out alive, I swear. Oh, had you brain and voice to tell where he may be now, dodging all my fury. Bashed by this hand and bashed on this rock wall, his brains would strew the floor, and I should have rest from the outrage nobody worked upon me. He sent us into the open then. Close by, I dropped and rolled clear of the ram's belly, going this way and that to untie the men. With many glances back, we rounded up his fat, stiff-legged sheep to take a aboard and drove them down to where the good ship lay. We saw, as we came near, our fellows' faces shining. Then we saw them turn to grief, tallying those who had not fled from death. I hushed them, jerking head and eyebrows up, and in a low voice told them, Load this herd, move fast, and put the ship's head toward the breakers. They all pitched in at loading, then embarked and struck their oars into the sea. Far out, as far offshore as shouted words would carry, I sent a few back to the adversary. O oh, Cyclops, would you feast on my companions? Puny am I in a caveman's hands? How do you like the beating that we gave you, you damned cannibal? Eater of guest under your roof, Zeus and the gods have paid you. The blind thing in his doubled fury broke a hilltop in his hands and heaved it after us. Ahead of our black prow it struck and sank, whelmed in a spuming geyser, a giant wave that washed the ship stern foremost back to shore. I got the longest boat hook out and stood fending us off, with furious nods to all to put their backs into a racing stroke. Row, row or perish. So the long oars bent, kicking the foam starward, sternward, making head until we drew away, and twice as far. Now when I cupped my hands, I heard the crew in low voices protesting. God's sake, Captain, why bait the beast again? Let him alone. That tidal wave he made on the first throw all but beached us, all but stove us in. Give him our bearing with your trumpeting, he'll get the range and lob a boulder. Aye, he'll smash our timbers and our heads together. I would not heed them in my glorying spirit, but let my anger flare and yelled. Cyclops, if ever mortal man inquire how you were put to shame and blinded, tell them, Odysseus, raider of cities, took your eye, Laertes' son, whose home's on Ithaca. At this he gave a mighty sob and rumble. Now comes the weird upon me, spoken of old. A wizard, grand and wondrous, lived here. Telemus, a son of Eurymus. Great length of days he had in wizardry among the Cyclopes, and these things he foretold for time to come. My great eye lost, and at Odysseus's hands. Always I had in mind some giant, armed in giant force, would come against me here. But this, but you, small, pitiful, and twiggy, you put me down with wine, you blinded me? Come back, Odysseus, and I'll treat you well, praying the god of earthquake to befriend you, his son I am, for he, by his avowal, fathered me, and, if he will, he may heal me of this black wound, he and no other of all the happy gods or mortal men. Few words I shouted in reply to him. If I could take your life, I would, and take your time away, and hurl you down to hell. The god of earthquake could not heal you there. At this, he stretched his hands out in his darkness towards the sky of stars and prayed Poseidon. 
O hear me, Lord, blue girdler of the islands, if I am thine indeed, and thou art father, grant that Odysseus, raider of cities, never see his home. Laertes' son, I mean, who kept his hall on Ithaca, should destiny intend that he shall see his roof again, among his family and his fatherland, far be that day, and dark the years between. Let him lose all companions, and return under strange sail to bitter days at home.